Hello everyone. Um, I must apologise for being so late. Um, I have a few excuses. The first one is I am technologically disadvantaged, disadvantaged and couldn't get into the computer. Um, and the second is I have a 24-hour-old um, foal colicking at the moment. So um, I've been a little bit um, sidetracked with that. So before we get started, I just want to make sure that everyone can hear me. So if you can just type in the question box that you can hear me loud and clear, that would be wonderful. And we will get started um, 10 minutes late, unfortunately. Um, I'll just wait and see that people can hear me. Um, okay, so that should be good. Okay, so let me just, my computer's having a little bit of an issue um, tonight, so hopefully um, we don't have any glitches in the system, but just have to double check that I'm recording this so that everyone um, can hear me, uh, so that every, everyone, sorry, can uh, get a copy of this. So I'm pretty sure that that is working. Um, okay, so let's get started. So. Um, just as an the reason um, I chose this um, this topic was because um, I actually had a uh, a client um, say to me the other day, uh, and this client has been uh, around horses all their life, and they said that they were purchasing a horse, uh, and they'd had a vet check done. Um, and the horse came up lame, but they they weren't there when the the vet check occurred, and um, they said to me that um, the vet check uh, said that the horse was lame, but the seller said the horse has never had a lame day in its life, and um, that they um, bought the horse anyway. And I was just absolutely amazed that um, this client actually did that um, because um, the. Uh, the, the first thing when purchasing a horse I always say to people is buyer beware. Um, it, it's one of those things that um, I put people selling horses in the same category as real estate agents and used car dealers. They are trying to sell you something uh, and they will always tell you what you want to hear. So uh, I just thought this webinar I'd go through some of the common mistakes um, people go through when they're buying a horse and um, as I was searching through the internet for some pictures, um, this one came up and it said, healing broke to ride, 90 days under saddle, kids safe, trail rides, ready for the show ring. That's just your typical um, advert that you'll get, uh, you know, where you think it's only a yearling, why have they broken a yearling in and how can it be kid safe um, and ready for trail rides when the thing is only 12 months old. So these are the types of things we see all the time uh, and I just want to run through um, some things you as a horse owner wanting to purchase a horse can do. I don't uh, agree that everyone needs to get a vet check and um, I know plenty of horses that have been bought under um, the guidance of a vet and um, they've turned up lame. So I'm certainly not here to preach about um, uh, vet checks, uh, but just some basic uh, simple things as a horse owner or even when you're wanting to start out, uh, simple things to look for when purchasing a horse. So let me just get down here. Whoops, okay. So the first thing is if it sounds too good to be true, then chances are it is. Um, you know, the, the, um, the four-year-old horse that uh, ticks all of your checklists um, and it's only a thousand dollars then there's clearly something uh, wrong with that horse or um, you very rarely get a bargain like that without uh, without problems. So the first thing if you're looking for a horse know what you want, know what you want the horse for and if you are a beginner please get help because um, a person starting out wanting to purchase their first horse just has um, uh, you know things written on their forehead that should not be there, and and people take advantage. The the most common problem we have is uh, people purchasing horses, and and they said, but you know the the seller told me that the horse was ideal for what I wanted, and you know uh, and it's completely not. So um, and then if you are a beginner, then potentially that's when a pre-purchase exam is really important because. A vet will not only check all of the physical things out on the horse, but they will also check temperament and whether it's suitable for your needs as well. 
Um, so if you're a beginner, sometimes a veterinary pre-purchase is um, advisable. Um, or if you've got a, you know, good friends that have been around horses um, uh, quite a while and, and know what they're doing is also, um, sometimes that can be dangerous, but a lot of the time it's better than um, being a beginner. Um, and the, the most important thing when purchasing a horse is believe nothing. So just completely ignore what the people selling the horse is telling you. And I understand a lot of us are, are honest and we would tell the truth, but there's just unfortunately so many people out there that just you just have to basically ignore everything that they have said um, and, and go with your gut and, and, and what you know about horses. <coughs> so we um, have a bit of a joke in our, in our clinic when we um, ha have a client that's just bought a new horse and they're, they're often bringing it in for us to look it over. They've already purchased the horse and um, or the horse isn't putting on weight or something like that. So they get us out and they say to us, you know, we've just purchased this horse, got it home um, and or, you know, it's got some behavioural problem or, or it's um, skittish or something like that. And we'll run through the the you know list of questions and every horse that seems to be bought in our area may not be Australia wide but in our area um, when you ask them you know when was it when were its teeth done the the new owner will say oh the, the previous owners told me that um, they had the teeth done six months ago or just recently or uh, you know certainly within the first, within the last 12 months and then they'll and then you'll say to them okay so vaccinations what are, no no they're all up to date they've just been vaccinated as well and then when you question them well what date were they vaccinated for or what were they vaccinated with that's when they start to get a little bit vague they're just like oh no 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 they just said everything was up to date and worming is another prime example that um, people that are selling horses tend to just go, oh, yep, 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 wormed it just the other day. It's, it's coming up to being due, but it's not quite due yet. And so then you'll question them and say, okay, so what did you worm it with last time? You know, if you have the um, ability to talk to the, the seller, they're like, oh, I'm not, not quite sure. And then you say, well, what date did you worm the horse on? Oh, look, it was definitely in the last month. Um, feet are something that they can't really lie about because you can actually see them. Uh, but we'll have, uh, you know, people say that the farrier was here eight weeks ago and, and the shoes are falling off or they've got no shoes but the cracks are, uh, are horrendous and, and the sole is so thick and, and dead. Um, and there's some simple things that um, you can just predict that they'll, they'll say. Or the farrier's due this week, that's another perfect one that we get. Um, you know, if we go and do a pre-purchase, they'll say, yep, no, the farrier um, is coming out this week and, uh, and the farrier never turns up. Um, another question, uh, you know, we'll, we'll ask is, you know, has the horse ever been lame? And no, no, never been lame, never had a problem in its life. And then you look at its feet and you can see that there's a massive hoof crack or an abscess blew out. And, um, and those are the sorts of things that the horse had to be lame with. So all these little things give you an indication of, um, of questions and the, I suppose the credibility of the seller. Those sellers out there that are completely honest, um, there are some out there, so I'm not saying everyone selling horses um, are rogues, but um, you'll you'll get them and, and they'll be there and, and you say, okay, so when did, um, when did your horse last have its teeth done? And they'll pull out a nice little piece of paper from the vet that, um, or the, the lay dentist, and it'll have the date that the horse's teeth were done and, and what the what the person found. Uh, and then you'll ask them the vaccinations and they'll, again, they'll be able to prove to you that there was a vaccination done at the same time as a dental or things like that. Um, and, and worming, you know, the, the, the good horse owners out there will have had this recorded and know exactly when they were done and when they were due. When you're buying a horse and they'll say to you, they're a bit vague with their questions, then I think from that point on you have to disregard everything that they say as they're just telling you what you want to hear. Um, another brilliant one we have in the area, um, in our area, is the age of a horse and uh, the amount of horses that age 10 years from when the person buys the horse to when we go out to do their teeth or, or have a look at them for some other problem, is it just astounds me how horses can age so quickly. And it's just purely because the people that have bought the horse have, have trusted the person that they're buying the horse off and have believed everything that they've said, but unfortunately, um, a lot of the time that's not the case. So 
Uh, we have another horse dealer in our area and it, I, this is a perfect one. We have so many people ring us up to do a pre-purchase on a horse that this person may be selling. Um, and they put good money on these horses, they're 10 to 15,000. And, um, and the, 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 the buyer will ring up and say, look, I'm just going to go and get a pre-purchase done. And this particular seller will say, oh, oh, okay, well, the vet needs to be able to do it tomorrow because I've got five other people interested in this horse. And, and if you waste your time on a pre-purchase, the horse may be sold underneath you. And um, all of these things are just, you know, just guises to get people to, to part with their money and, and purchase the horse then and there. And it's that scarcity um, that this last point, um, this particular buyer is using. And, and people ring us saying, look, you've got to get there today because otherwise the horse will be sold underneath me. And when we ask who's selling the horse in the area, we can say to them, I can guarantee you that that horse will still be, a, you know, on, uh, will still be for sale in two weeks' time. And, um, and sure enough, to this day, we haven't been wrong. But um, the, some people out there are just unscrupulous, and um, and it, it just it upsets me because they're only damaging the horse industry. Um, so you know, these these people are the majority. They're not the minority. I would love to say they're the minority, but unfortunately, they're not. So now, um, so the best thing to do when you're going to buy a horse is know what you want know exactly what you want. So this is a you know typical checklist. Okay, so I don't want a mare, I want a gelding. It has to be a certain height. Um, I want a particular age bracket. Um, you know, exactly what you want because if you've got it written down, chances are you will uh, get what you want and you won't um, stray from this. It's so often that people will uh, be a bit wishy-washy with what they, and that's fine if you're, you don't have a specific checklist, but if you do have a checklist, write it down so you can, you know, when you're searching for the right horse, you've got it in front of you and you can just quickly tick off the horses that are not appropriate. So that'll halve your list of what you have to go through. And one big thing, be careful at auctions. Uh, we have um, uh, lately sales in our area. So they're, they're the dogger sales, but they put horses through that are broken in and, uh, and, and they do go for cheap and you will get a bargain as long as you know what you're looking for. Uh, there, you know, there's, there's plenty of horses that go through there and, and turn out beautiful horses. But there's also those that you have to be aware that potentially could be sedated, they could be drugged, they could be on butte. Um, so you just have to be aware that when you go to an auction, just think about it as if, if the horse is no good, am I happy to have wasted that money? And you can get um, caught up if any of you have bought houses or anything via an auction. You can get caught up in the, the whole ego of, of winning the bid and, uh, and and getting caught up in the moment. And um, I actually um, went to the Magic Millions. Uh, this is a picture of um, the sales in England, but um, it's the same sort of thing over here in Australia. And uh, one year I went to the Magic Millions and I was standing with a client and um, he did exactly that. He got very carried away with a particular horse. Um, and before the sale, he was telling me, you know, he said, oh, you know, it's only probably worth 80000 And he ended up paying 120000 for the horse. And he went a little over budget. Um, it would be nice to have that budget, but he did go a little over budget. Um, and he just got swept up in the, the emotion of, of an auction and, and winning. And, and it happens, um, we have a lot of um, uh, people you know, bidding against um, doggers and things like that. And, and some of the horses are emaciated or, you know, they have problems and, and people just get caught up and, and end up um, paying too much for horses that, um, you know, that, that weren't uh, worth the money. So if you are in an auction and you go to an auction, just be really mindful of the, the top dollar you want to pay and pull out uh, when you get to that. Certainly paying 585000 might be a bit too much for a horse. Um, so these these are the the things um, all horse owners should you should be able to do your own pre-purchase. So when you go to have a look at a horse, um, and again, we have a lot of people that will buy horses sight unseen. Again, if you don't get a vet check and you buy a horse sight unseen, you're really really trusting the person selling that horse. And you know you may have someone that knows this person, or there's you know there's some sort of character reference I suppose for the horse and that's all well and good but just be mindful if you don't know the people from a bar of soap buying a horse sight unseen without a vet check even being done is 
is very, very risky. Um, horses can look wonderful in photos and videos, um, but you don't know what, um, you know, what potentially they've given the horse. Um, I highly, highly, highly recommend not buying a horse sight unseen unless you are getting a vet check done or you have a, you know, a friend that you trust that can go and look at the horse. Um, so the, the first, the, the, you know, the few things that you need to be able to do yourself um, when, when purchasing a horse is the first thing is to just a, be able to age the horse. And I don't mean, you know, to, to be able to age it within 12 months, but to know the difference between a 10 year old and a 20 year old horse is really important. Uh, we just see so many people just get ripped off. Um, and even we had a five year old horse that turned out to be 15. So just to be able to, you know, have a look at those um, incisor uh, teeth and, and just to get a, an idea of, you know, whether they're um, taller than they are shorter. And if you want to go and refresh um, your memory about ageing horses, we do have the previous webinar we've done on horse ageing. Um, so go back and have a look at that to just refresh your memory on how to age horses. Um, the first thing is, uh, sorry, the second thing is itchy horses um, and you might think, well, that's a bit strange, you know, why would I avoid an itchy horse? So unless you live in Tasmania or, or somewhere cool where you don't have biting insects, itchy horses can be an absolute nightmare of horses to own. They go through rugs, they, um, you know, they, they don't have it. And if you're into showing, if you're into trail riding, then that's fine. But if you're into showing horses and competition and things like that. There's nothing worse than an itchy horse with no mane or tail. Um, but if you're wanting it for stock work, well then, you know, maybe that's that's okay for you. But you need to be able to maintain them, um, be able to rope them to prevent it getting um, really, really severe. And if you're wanting to buy a horse for breeding, buying itchy horses, um, Queensland itch, those sorts of things, stay well away from them because it is quite heritable. Um, and if you've got a mare that's that's um, rubbing herself silly, then it's just it's really annoying trying to um, you know keep the foal safe and, and keep her in foal. And all of those management problems um, can be quite uh, an issue. Another thing I haven't put here is behavioural issues in as much as wind sucking and weaving. Uh, unless you can electrify your property. Um, buying a windsucker can be really, really, really frustrating. So just keep an eye on um, behavioural issues or weavers and, and things like that. Um, that and crib, uh, crib biters, so horses that sit there and suck on wood and even the windsuckers. Uh, when you go to have a look at the horse's teeth, um, that will give you an indication when you look at the incisors if they're worn down and it'll give you an indication that there are some behavioural issues going on with that horse as well. Um, the other thing to, you know, when you're doing your vet check is just have a look at any swellings. Um, and this is over over knees and, uh, and you know, around the joints and things like that. The amount of people that will buy horses with a swollen knee and not sort of, I suppose, put two and two together and, and think that potentially that might be a problem. Um, and even wingles and, and swellings and bumps and lumps and, and all those sorts of things are really important to have a look at. So when you go yourself to have a look at a horse, make sure you touch that horse all over and, you know, feel the joints. And you don't need to be a vet to be able to feel that there's a bit too much fluid over a knee or, um, or over a hock or something like that. So just give the horse a good um, feel over and, and, you know, just lift the legs up and, and see how quiet it is. I mean, you, you're forking over money and the amount of people that don't um, go and have a look at a horse and pick their feet up, they just look at it from a distance. You know, it's, it's sort of an investment um, having a horse. So really looking the horse over is really important. And I think also, um, coming from, you know, uh, the seller's point of view, when you look confident and know what you're doing, they start to, you know, go, oh, okay, this person, you know, we, we might have to um, tell them here because, that, you know, they sort of know what they're doing. So um, just, you know, feeling the horse over um, and, and questioning them while you're doing that. Um, horses with crooked legs, uh, pigeon-toed horses, um, horses with knees, uh, knee problems, you know, they're all horses that uh, if they're going cheap enough, that's great. But if you've got to spend a bit of money on them, these things can lead into problems and, uh, you know, crooked, uh, if they're pigeon-toed, then they often need to be um, shod with, um, you know, particular shoes to keep them um, so that they don't keep clipping themselves. Um, 
or, or causing problems. And, and looking at a horse that has got um, pigeon toes, look at the scarring and things like that on the insides of um, the front legs usually. Um, can give you an indication if there's any scarring or, or, or there have been problems in the past. Um, I've put white hooves here um, only because um, there's a, a bit of an a old saying uh, with white hooves because they are a lot softer than the black hooves and if you're on sandy soils or um, have black mud that um, you do actually get decent rain, the white hooved horses can be um, a bit of a problem um, and the, the old saying is one white hoof buy it two white hooves try it, three white hooves look well about it and four white hooves go home without it. So a um, bit of an um, old saying there um, that the old horse people used to use. Um, and so it is, a, you know, it is something to think about and hooves are the foundation for a horse. So if they have hooves that are not well kept or they look horrendous, then bear in mind that's going to be a long term problem for you also. Um, and then I've got lumps and bumps, you know, feeling um, around the, the throat area and just seeing if any glands are up or there's any swellings or anything like that. Um, it's really important to, um, to be able to, you know, um, have a look at and, and see whether they're going to be um, painful or, you know, if the horse resents having things touched, um, that, that there's pain going on. So lumps and bumps are also really important. And, and also looking when there's a bit of skin off, you know, that could be the start of a sarcoid. So again, not a career ending um, problem, but things you want to be aware of uh, when you're purchasing a horse. So any bits of hair that have come off, just have a good look at them that it is just hair and the skin's not flaking and you know lumpy underneath. And, um, and I love asking people, you know, have there been, has the horse ever been lame? And they're like, no, no, no. And then you look at the scars on the horse's leg and think, you know, <laughs> the horse had to be lame at some stage because it's got a massive gaping scar, um, you know, down its back leg and uh, and and things that um, you know people don't uh, that the honest horse owners will say to you, oh yeah, that scars because you know it went through a fence and um, but you know it hasn't been lame since and, and all those sorts of things are really important to uh, to uh, to be able to ask and and um, find out what happened and, and when it happened. So. Um, and another really big thing are eyes, you know, have a look at the horse's eyes, make sure that they're not, um, there's no cloudiness, no spots or anything like that, that they're not weeping. Um, and there's a few other conditions um, we'll run through in a second uh, when you're looking at eyes. So the first big one is the real age of the horse and this is, this is just a demonstration of um, you know, opening just the side of the mouth and have a look at those side incisors. Um, another good thing you can do you know, if they say, oh yeah, 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 just had its teeth done, is you can often pull the horses, grab the horse's tongue and pull it to the side um, and whichever side you pull the tongue, go on the other side and, and put your, run your hands up inside the gum and the, beside the gum and the teeth. Um, on the outside and that will, um, you can feel sharp points and things like that and the horse won't bite you because they'll be biting on their tongue if they do that. Um, so that's a, you know, sort of a, a layman's way of checking if the horse's teeth um, have been done. Uh, and if you can feel those first few premolars and they, they feel quite nice and smooth, then chances are they have had their teeth done recently. But if you uh, do that and you feel sharp points, then you know that, you know, the horse's dental care hasn't been, um, it hasn't been thought of. And then you need to look at things like, um, you know, waves and, and things like that that could be in that horse's mouth. So um, that's just a, a quick way of checking um, a horse's teeth. Um, so the itchy horse, um, just got some pictures here and as you can appreciate having itchy horses, they scratch on everything, you put rugs on them, they go through, you know, three rugs unless you've got everything hot taped, um, hot wired um, so they can't rub and they can just be a bit of a nightmare so uh, that, you know, they're irritable, they don't want to do whatever you want them to do because they're itchy um, and sometimes they can be that red raw that, you know, you just don't want to take them out or ride them because they're so itchy. Um, and I suppose bearing in mind buying a horse from down south and bringing it to Queensland, it can often develop Queensland itch. So um, it's always uh, sometimes a good idea to buy something from you, in your area. Um, but usually the ideal horse or the horse that you really want is from down south. Um, so, and you know, Queensland itch is something you can't avoid. But if you're buying an itchy horse, you just have to bear that in mind that that's a management thing. Um, and if your property, you know, if you've got a creek or 
running water or stagnant water on your place, then you know that will exacerbate the problem, and um, and it's something you'll need to manage. Um, so legs. Um, so the picture on the left hand side of the screen is showing wind galls, and let me just see. So this here is a wind gall. So it's just an out pouching of the. Um, the superficial tendons and, and um, suspensory and things like that. So these don't necessarily mean that there's a problem, but sometimes there can be an underlying problem. So if your horse, if the horse that you're looking at buying has wind galls, it is advisable to get it looked at or do your own flexion tests um, while you're there. And if there's any lameness associated, then you know. I'd, I'd be um, getting that horse uh, x-rayed or um, or some sort of um, further diagnostics done before you bought the horse. Um, like I said, they often don't mean anything, but sometimes I can indicate that there's degeneration and arthritis starting. Um, and then the, the pictures on the um, on the right hand side are just pictures of um, bow tendons. Um, we had a client the other day um, paid uh, what did she pay twenty five thousand dollars for a horse, um, and she completely missed that the horse had a bow tendon. And again, didn't get a vet check done, um, but completely missed that the horse had the bow tendon. So, um, and and the, the you know the seller had to know that the horse had bowed its tendon, and I think they were probably sitting back. You know, thinking, oh my goodness, how amazing is this? We've sold this horse and it's got a boat tendon. So um, there's people out there, and they will do it. So um, so just be careful of boat tendons, and that's where these swellings um, occur at the back of the leg. <laughs> so again, you know, just be really. This is you know obvious picture of a of a swollen knee, but any sort of swelling over joints is never a really good sign. Um, it's something that needs to be investigated. I certainly wouldn't be purchasing a horse unless it was a lead line 24-year-old pony for my, you know, three-year-old um, that I just want to lead around for, you know, five minutes once every every other weekend, and the horse is sound in the paddock. Um, then potentially I would um, I would pay a few hundred dollars for a horse like that. But if you're wanting to spend money and and use the horse for something. Um, you know, even just pleasure riding, um, you've got to be mindful of all of these swellings and, and lumps and bumps and, um, and have them investigated. So feet. Feet are the biggest um, problem I find with, uh, with purchasing horses. And this picture at the top is, you know, you sort of your typical um, white hooved, it's flaky. Um, it's you know you can see the stress rings here that the horse has been under, you know nutritional stress or something going on, or it's had laminitis or something like that. These these are indications um, that the horse is has not been doing well. And hooves are like tree trunks. You know you can tell so much about a horse just from their hooves and, and how they've been treat you know how they've nutritionally been treated and and things like that. Um, and then this picture on the bottom right hand side is a, a great indicator that this um, this horse was lame at some stage and that's where a hoof abscess has blown out and it's just grown down. So this would have blown out of the coronary band up here and it would have just gradually, so that's probably about three months ago that that horse was lame um, and it's just gradually growing, growing down, the hoof is growing down to, to nice healthy hoof um, above it there. So this is a good indicator that that horse has you know um, the potential. To, I mean, every horse has potentials for hoof abscesses. But if you see these in all four feet, or there's there's a few of them, then you know you've potentially got some some underlying issue um, with you know whether it's white line disease or or um, you know um, thrush or something like that going on in the hoof. So it's a very unhealthy hoof, uh, and you need to pick that hoof up and look underneath it. And and you know this picture here shows a hoof abscess, and you know there's a bit of white line disease and there's a bit going on in this hoof that um, you know just picking up a horse's hoof is so important when you're going to buy it and, and you pick it up and you'll often see all of this sole is so dead and thick and, and flaking off and it's you know that's a good indication that that horse hasn't been cared for um, feet wise and, and there could be could be issues going on um, if the horse is lame that it could potentially just be because they haven't had the feet done. 
Um, and coronary band is um, an area to really, really check. And when you go and have a look at a horse, just put your thumb and press all the way around that coronary band. And if the horse reacts or carries on, then you know that there's some issues. And, and we'll often see this picture at the bottom here where there's been a, an injury to the coronary band and there's a massive crack. Um, going all the way to the coronary bend and this horse would have to be lame like that that shearing effect of these um, both sides and, and the, the wound there um, is quite painful and buying a horse like this one here at the bottom right that's going to be an ongoing farrier um, issue and potentially you may never get that hoof crack out so that horse would have to be shot for the rest of its life um, so little things like that you have to be aware of and, and looking at the horse's feet um, are so important and over here you can see two white hooves and they just flake away and crack and and if you're on sandy soil or uh, any really any sort of soil with these horses you have to be so on top of the farrier work and and have a reliable farrier um, you know there's plenty of horses out there that are that are um, as tough as nails and you know their hooves are as solid as and really um, the upkeep for them is brilliant you know it's very low maintenance but if you're getting um, a horse with white hooves then they always have a tendency to get hoof cracks um, and you know they um, are more prone to hoof abscesses and things like that um, but if they've had an injury to the coronary band then that's long term um, uh, you know uh, shoeing and, and caring caring for them and, and sometimes you know um, you live in an area where farriers are as rare as hen's teeth or um, you know you, you might have to book them six months in advance um, these are the types of horses you don't sort of want to have to deal with in those situations and if you don't have a, a sound horse then you just don't have a horse you know you, you're constantly um, dealing with lamenesses and, and issues like that so be really mindful if you're, you know, looking at a horse with with hoof, uh, hoof issues that um, that you need to have that reliability of a farrier and, and uh, things like that. So, you know, you um, as a purchaser can quite easily do a flexion test yourself. You don't need a vet to do this, um, and it's just a simple case of flexing the entire limb. Um, the picture at the top um, left hand side is showing um, the forelimb flexed. Um, and when we do a flexion test, we, we put it in this position and we hold it for about 50 seconds. Uh, and that gives um, a lot of pressure on all of the joints in the, in the limbs. And, um, and it's basically like giving them a, a full day's hard work. And then the, the idea is you, you put it in this position, you count to 50 seconds. Um, some people do it for a minute, some people do it a bit longer, but you know, 50 seconds. 50 seconds minimum and then you get the horse to that first step needs to be a trot so you, you basically drop the leg and ask the horse to trot out um, and if the horse has a head bob or is lame then that's a positive flexion test so that means that there's something going on it doesn't necessarily tell you that it's joint soft tissue or anything like that but you know that that horse is not going to withstand a really hard day's work without being a little bit sore. So this is certainly something you can do yourself at, uh, you know, when you're looking at a horse and do all four limbs um, and then just see as well, sometimes the horse will have a few scratchy steps so they'll have a bit of a head bob for a few steps but then they'll trot out uh, and become sound and that's that's a, still a pass. Um, it's when you flex the, t the leg and, you know, for, for 20 metres, they're, they're still lame. And you don't have to trot them out for a kilometre. It only really has to be 20 to 30 metres, um, but it needs to be in a straight line. If you can't do that, you can always flex them and lunge them, uh, which is the picture down the bottom. And again, some lamenesses will appear um, on a lunge. So I always, uh, when we go out, we always do flexion test and trot them out in a straight line. And then we ask the, the owners to lunge them. Um, and, and that'll often show up more soft tissue lamenesses um, when, when they're going into tight circles and things like that. So lunging them is a, a great way. Um, to pick up any subtle lamenesses that may not have been there in a straight line. So, and it's always important to trot them out on a sort of a semi-hard surface, not like you know bitumen, but you don't want it to be lush um, grass or sand because that can hide uh, lamenesses. So it needs to be a, a semi-solid surface and, and a straight line for about 20 to 30 metres. 
Um, but again, t flexion tests aren't something that are specific to vets. You, uh, as horse owners, can do them yourself, and um, and it's you know some of them are pretty impressive when you do a flexion test. They're, they're dog lame, and and they're the horses that you need to really question. Um, you know, right? Okay, there, there was a lameness there. We need to look at it before I purchase it if it's something that you really really want, um, or you walk away then and there knowing that there's some underlying issue. So eyes, um, very, very few people look into a horse's eye when they are purchasing the horse. And um, again, we had one about four months ago, she paid 42,000, I think it was for a horse. Um, again, um, she uh, was fairly, she thought she was a fairly knowledgeable horse person um, and she bought the horse for show jumping. Um, and it turned out that the horse had um, cataracts, so that horse was not suitable. And the previous owners were selling it because it kept knocking into jumps, uh, which they didn't disclose at time of sale. Um, but um, they later found out once the money was in the bank that that's why the people were selling. And the reason it was um, smashing into jumps is because it couldn't see. Um, so always look into horses' eyes when you're purchasing them. And there's three things you want to have a look at. So the cornea, which is just that clear outer you know, layer of the eye, it's really important to have a look at that. The other thing is the pupil, so the, you know, the, the black bit in the, in the centre of the eye. Um, you want to be able to make sure that that will constrict and dilate. So a simple thing to do is to put your hand over, if you're in the bright sun, um, put your hand over its eye for about 20 seconds and then when the horse, when you remove your hand, the horse's eye will open and you need to make sure that that pupil constricts. So, uh, sorry. Yeah, so it'll be dilated when you put your hand over it, so making it dark, it'll get bigger. And then when you take your hand away, it needs to shrink down, and it needs to do that fairly quickly. Um, and that's a good indication that the, the pupil is responsive and, and can deal with changes in um, brightness and things like that, which is really, really important, especially um, if you're buying quarter horses and, and things like that, or um, you know, Perlinos and Cremellos, um, to, to make sure that they're not day, day or night blind. Um, that's a great um, test to do with those. So checking that their pupils are uh, responsive is really important. And then the cornea, the picture on um, the screen is actually showing blood vessels, so little spider blood vessels coming along that cornea. That's what we call an unhappy cornea. So those blood vessels um, should not be there. And blood vessels only appear in a cornea when it's um, traumatised, damaged or healing. So um, this, this horse has got a condition um, which is potentially an immune mediated keratitis. Um, and it can be a, a very big problem, unless this horse has had an ulcer at some stage and it's healing. Um, but without staining the eye, I couldn't tell you which of these cases it is. But I can tell you if I saw that on a horse I was wanting to buy, I would be running for the hills. So eyes can be very, very expensive to treat, um, especially if the blood vessels are this far advanced in an eye. Um, I would be well and truly um, staying well away from this horse. Um, so really have a look in the eye. The cornea should be clear, so no whiteness, no dots in it, no nothing. Um, you want a nice clear cornea um, and then you know that's, that's worth purchasing. But if you see cloudiness or a white spot, uh, anything like that, you need to know more about that, that horse's condition. And if the, if the seller of the horse says, oh, I don't know, I haven't ever noticed that, well then, I wouldn't be um, purchasing that horse because they can have problems such as recurrent uveitis. Um, you know, there's a there's a myriad of conditions that um, that horse could be um, could be heading towards. The other thing to look at is the third eyelid, um, which is the the little um, flap at the in the corner in the middle corner. Um, sorry, the, the lower corner of the eye. Um, if horses. Um, uh, are grey or you know paints and things like that. They can be prone to um, getting uh, squamous cell carcinomas and uh, and problems of the third eyelid if, if they're white. So um, make sure you have a look at the third eyelid um, and, and make sure that there's no trauma. Or, and you can see if they've had something removed before because it needs to be nice and smooth. So um, if it's not nice and smooth and there's issues um, with the third eyelid, then you need to um, be very mindful of that. 
So um, these are just some examples of eyes. This is a in the, the picture on the top right is a third eyelid that has a squamous cell carcinoma. Um, sometimes it can be um, habronema, which um, if horses have really deep pockets and uh, flies can actually land in their eyes and, and lay little larvae in there. Um, and so it is uh, advisable to have a third eyelid uh, looked at um, because sometimes it can just be a habronema, not a squamous cell carcinoma and the treatment of a, of a habronema is very easy. You just put some um, you put some wormer in the horse's eye and it should resolve within about a fortnight. So um, certainly something if you go out and see a horse that has an eye like this and you want to purchase the horse, ask the people to put um, some wormer in the horse's eye, an ivermectin based wormer and, uh, and come back in a fortnight's time and if it's gone um, then you're, you know, you're uh, happy to purchase the horse but if it's still there then I would be walking away because that, that um, third eyelid needs to be removed. But again if it's, if it's a horse that you really love and it, it has a squamous cell carcinoma, once you remove the third eyelid um, it, uh, it, it's resolved nine times out of ten. Uh, but it's certainly something that you, you know, would be asking for the purchase price um, to be reduced to have that condition um, corrected. Um, and then the picture on the the lower um, on the lower part of the screen, if you're looking at a cornea and it looks like that, hop in your car and drive away fast. So this horse has um, potentially recurrent uveitis, but it has um, uveitis and um, a very very unhappy cornea. So. Um, you know, certainly don't be purchasing this horse. So recurrent uveitis is a condition that uh, will flare up any time the horse gets a little bit stressed or unhappy um, and the eye just continually just clouds over and, and uh, becomes very painful uh, and you can't, um, you can't use that horse. Um, they sort of become blind when that cloudiness is as bad as that. So um, a very big problem in horses that you don't want to have to deal with. So we've gone through a lot of um, you know uh, things to look out for, but I think one of the really important things when purchasing a horse is you have to be compatible with that horse, and that's what scares me when you when people purchase horses sight unseen because you don't get a feeling for the horse's personality and temperament, and uh, you know, and that can be a, a real. Um, uh, you know, a real turn off when you're purchasing the horse. You have to click with that horse, and you have to um, be, get the horse and, and understand it, and, and just um, showing up and you know potentially riding it, uh, and all those sorts of things just really gives you the feel for the horse's personality and whether it will um, mesh with yours. It's different if you're purchasing a horse for breeding purposes. Then you know you're not going to be. Um, particularly bonding with the horse sometimes, but if you're going to be using this horse for competition or trail riding, your personalities have to match. And you know, people um, that have dealt with horses understand what I'm saying. That horses do have personalities, and uh, and you really have to to get along with each other, and and not um, you know, it's a bit like a family member that you don't really you sort of wish you weren't you related to. Um, you know, buying a horse, you really have to be. Um, comfortable around them and, and not be scared of them and, and really sort of get where they're coming from. So um, I think buying a horse, um, you, you really have to have that bond with them. So I do feel that that's extremely important when purchasing a horse as well. Um, nowadays with the whole um, legalities of um, trialling a horse, um, you know, I, when I was growing up you always uh, got the horse for a, a month's trial and uh, you know it was great because you could you know really tell whether you were going to get on with the horse and, and whether it's what you wanted but nowadays you sort of don't tend to have that luxury as, as much as um, you used to just with the whole legalities of uh, you know if the horse hurts itself who pays the bill and, um, and all of those sorts of things so there can be um, it still can happen nowadays but it's very much of a uh, an arrangement that's often contracts and um, and things like that so um, horses temperaments are extremely important so I'll just quickly touch on um, pre-purchase examinations um, and again if you're purchasing a horse for a thousand dollars you really have to you know, decide whether a pre-purchase is, is worth the money or not. 
um, pre-purchases are anywhere from uh, $300 to you know, $500 depending on uh, where you're located and that doesn't include x-rays, x-rays uh, um, on top of that. Um, so if you're spending $1,000 on a horse then potentially it's a risk worth taking and not getting a pre-purchase done. But if you're spending, you know, five to fifteen to forty plus thousand dollars, you're crazy not to get an insurance uh, a pre-purchase exam. Now, a pre-purchase exam is pretty much an insurance policy. If you have a, a vet go out and check a horse out, and you get that horse home, and it turns out it has got a, a condition that um, was uh, missed on a pre-purchase, then you can get your money back. So. Um, a lot of vets won't do pre-purchases because of this. Um, we we have a lot of uh, we pay a lot of money for insurance to cover us for pre-purchases, and it is though um, an insurance policy. So if you get the horse home and it's dog lame, and the people were drugging the horse, and um, you know those sorts of things, and the and the vet said to you, you know, or didn't say to you. Um, you know, you really need to get x-rays done, then, you know, you have the ability to um, request your money back and um, through the vet's insurance, uh, that will happen. So I um, probably shouldn't be telling people this, but it is a great insurance policy getting a pre-purchase examination done on a horse. Um, it, not only that, it gives you the um, confidence that, you know, your horse won't have something like a, you know, a heart murmur, um, you know, they, they will tolerate exercise, we do the flexion tests, uh, we check the eyes thoroughly. Um, all of these things are done when a vet does a pre-purchase exam. So the main things that are done are the, um, you know, we, we take their temperature, their pulse, listen to their heart, make sure that there's no abnormalities of the heart, listen to the lungs, lung fields to make sure that there's no scarring or problems that um, respiratory wise could cause problems uh, and we check their uh, nerves to make sure that they have um, good proprioception and know where their limbs are. Uh, we do flexion tests to make sure that there's no lameness um, and then if there are issues we then discuss with the, the purchaser um, you know whether whether to go ahead with x-rays or um, whether to not or whether if there is a heart murmur is it a uh, uh, Know, a, a murmur that's going to cause issues with whatever discipline you want the horse for. Um, and it's it's a bit of an educated um, gamble then rather than just a gamble um, if you don't get a pre-purchase done. But like I say, if it's if it's a thousand dollar horse, then you know some people are happy to take a risk on a thousand dollars and if the horse doesn't turn out then they've only lost a thousand dollars. But then others, you know, um, have had a look at the horse, they love the horse and a thousand dollars is a big investment for them. So therefore a pre-purchase exam is highly, highly, you know, recommended, um, especially for beginner people um, that, you know, things that they could miss. Uh, a pre-purchase exam is, is just that reassurance that um, there isn't anything wrong with the horse. So um, and then if the horse is lame then, you know, um, x-rays or radiographs are, are required and the vet can do that then and there at the, the pre-purchase examination as well. So you've handed over your hard-earned cash, you've actually purchased the horse. There's a few things you need to, um, to think about when you're going to bring your horse home. So the first thing is don't bring a new horse um, home to your property and just shove it in the herd and, and hope for the best. You really do, especially if you have clued on that the seller is potentially not um, as honest as you would hope. You just want to quarantine that horse um, if it's come from, I mean, if, it, if this is a, an immaculate show pony that hasn't got a hair out of place, you don't potentially need to quarantine this horse. But if it's from someone that potentially isn't as, um, as honest as you'd like, it's always advisable to quarantine your horse. So the new horse needs to go away so that um, it can't touch noses with your other horses uh, and it needs to be quarantined for, uh, for four, uh, 14 days. So a fortnight is the most um, advisable to quarantine a horse. Some 
some people can't do this, their property isn't set up for this, um, but ideally you'd love to have the horse quarantined and the, you know, the, the guidelines I suppose for biosecurity is a five metre perimeter from the new horse to any other horses. So, but again, that's a fair bit of space that you need to, um, to quarantine a horse. But it's certainly advisable to not just, you know, come home and throw the horse in the paddock and, and let it fend for itself. Um, we get a lot of uh, injuries where people have done so. They just bring the horse home and, uh, you know, let the herd sort it out and, you know, we end up going for a stitch up because it's been put through a fence. So it's often good um, for new horses, especially if you have a herd of more than two or three, um, to not just throw a, a new horse into the herd because they do challenge for hierarchy and, and things like that. And putting a new horse um, in with a, a bigger herd, it's going to get ganged up on and, and things can go nasty very quickly. So, um, you know, a gentle introduction um, is always um, good where they can see each other over the yards or, or you know, the, the new horses in the yards and the others can come up to it and things like that. It's um, often advisable. Um, and then if you, if they can't show proof of, um, or they're a bit hazy on their vaccination, um, you know, question, just always assume that they're not vaccinated and just start their vaccination. Um, tetanus strangles are the most important things to vaccinate for, um, whether, depending on where you live in Australia, um, Hendra may or may not be a, a concern for you, but um, tetanus and strangles, we had a horse the other night um, die of tetanus. Um, it was a horrible, horrible death. It was a two-year-old, um, two-year-old quarter horse. Uh, the, the, Young lass um, didn't realise that tetanus was in Queensland. She was from Victoria. Um, the horse had never been vaccinated and the horse contracted tetanus and died three days later um, with a massive bill trying to save it. Um, but unfortunately, by the time she rang us, it was too far gone. And um, it's, it's just a condition that we shouldn't be seeing in this day and age uh, with the vaccination being so, um, so, um, you know, it is almost 100% um, effective against tetanus. So um, it's certainly something that if you purchase a new horse and there's no, um, or there's wishy-washy evidence that it was vaccinated, just start it again and make sure it's covered. Um, I always recommend worming a new horse, especially before you put it in with your herd. Um, it could have resistant worms or it could, um, it could be, you know, completely contaminated and it goes and poos on your pasture and therefore all of your other horses um, pick up its worm eggs and, um, and you know, you can have a real problem. So always worm out um, a new horse unless the, the previous owners can, you know, give you a date or tell you exactly when it's due um, or, or get a faecal egg count done um, to, to determine whether it does need worming or not. And the other thing is just check its teeth. Um, make sure it's, uh, again, if they can't show proof that the horse's teeth were done, um, then, uh, you know, it's, um, it's a case of just get them checked because you don't want them to start losing weight from the stress of moving and then find out it just needed its teeth doing. Um, and every, every vet that has um, done a horse's teeth always has the record. So um, the seller only has to give, um, give the okay to release information and you can ring their vet and say, you know, can you tell me when the teeth are due? Or the seller can tell you, uh, can do the same and, and ring up. So that's um, purchasing a horse in a nutshell. So I, um, I, I'm I hoping I covered everything. And again, I apologise for um, the late start. I um, had some technical difficulties and um, a little patient that I'm uh, desperate to get back to. So does anyone have any questions regarding purchasing a horse? I'm hoping that I um, even for those, you know, horse uh, horse people out there that have been doing this for um, years, my sister has just purchased another horse and um, she did the number one golden rule and bought it sight unseen. So um, I gave her a lecture. However, she did get a pre-purchase report um, and x-rays. So that's the only thing that um, I didn't completely chastise her over. But um, yeah, so... Anyway, <laughs> um, so if anyone, I can't see any questions coming through. Let me just double check that I'm looking in the right place because that can happen as well. 
No, I can't see any questions. So if anyone does have any questions, again, um, just shoot them through to me afterwards and I'm more than happy to answer them. But otherwise, I might call it a night and get to my little um, filly downstairs and uh, make sure she's okay. Thanks everyone. Good night.